I want to uh, introduce Tom Power, who actually has, uh, you know, like everyone, a, a bio in, the, in what we handed out, but I will just make this brief then. Uh, Tom is Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Telecommunications uh, at the White House in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Tom helps to develop and coordinate administra administration policy on spectrum and telecom issues, among other uh, issues. And he came to the White House from the Department of Commerce, where he was Chief of Staff at NTIA. Huh? Thanks, uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, good morning, everybody. Glad to see you all here. Um, Michael told me that uh, he thought you all would be hungry for my remarks, uh, or I think I misunderstood that, actually. You're just, you're just hungry, right? Because lunch is next, so. Um, but uh, I, I'm really happy to be here and talk about, uh, I don't know if it's the role of competition in auction policy or the role of auctions in competition policy. Did I just say the same thing twice? I meant it the other way. Um, but uh, either way you put it, I think uh, you know, we can all agree that promoting competition and, and, uh, and sustaining the benefits of competition is the preferred default approach over anything overly prescriptive or, or ad hoc regulation. Uh, and that's important in any area of the economy, but it's really important in this area that, that so many of us are so fortunate to work in. It's uh, been a, uh, a great area over the last few years, even in the worst uh, parts of the recession. Uh, the wireless ecosystem uh, was very productive, and you can find these numbers uh, in lots of different places. I, I stole a few from the letter that uh, CTIA sent to Chairman Wheeler the other day. Uh, U.S. wireless car carers invested $30 billion in their networks last year. And, and just to put that in scale, they pointed out that that works out to $94 per customer as opposed to an average in the rest of the world of $16 per customer. Um, we have half, uh, at least half of the world's LTE subscribers in this country. We're about 5% of the population, but half the subscribers. Um, and all of this is driving uh, productivity and job growth, of course, not just, not just for the carriers, but for all the related industries, whether it's towers or operating systems or app developers, uh, a, a really great American success story where American innovation is leading the way for the world. Uh, I should also point out, yesterday we had a great event over at the White House uh, celebrating the launch of an initiative called Warriors for Wireless, uh, where lots of uh, folks in the wireless industry are stepping up to hire veterans as they come back from uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, it's, uh, it's, a great, it's a great initiative they've, they've set up because they found funding through the the VA for the training programs that trains them to climb the towers and do the networking, uh, and the, and for the for the uh, industry where there's a great demand for this kind of labor, um, these returning vets who are hungry to uh, uh, to get back uh, into a domestic way of life. Uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity, uh, and it was the you know if I was doing a little research looking into this and whether it's Sprint or T-Mobile or Verizon Wireless, any of the carriers, you can read about. Uh, their great efforts uh, to hire vets. Uh, PCIA was there, American Tower, um, and AT&T, who has uh, really uh, stepped up, doubling their commitment to hire veterans. So congratulations to all of them on that great initiative. Um, all of this good news, of course, uh, uh, is why Spectrum uh, policy has been a great uh, focus and priority for the administration going back to 2010 when we issued uh, the first presidential memorandum uh, directing the FCC, uh, or directing NTIA and the agencies to work with the FCC to uh, find 500 megahertz of spectrum to repurpose for wireless broadband. Uh, the president uh, came up with a, a, a menu of uh, spectrum provisions in his American Jobs Act, which then largely were enacted in the form of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, uh, authorizing and directing more auctions at the FCC, of course the reverse incentive auctions. Uh, so we can uh, hopefully uh, uh, have a win-win-win a, a there in terms of reallocating spectrum, but also compensating broadcasters who relinquish their spectrum, um, preserving FCC authority over unlicensed uh, spectrum. And Michael, I know, uh, and others, but Michael in particular recently uh, issued his report uh, pointing out the huge productivity um, uh, gains through unlicensed. Uh, and of course, uh, FirstNet, uh, setting up FirstNet with uh, proceeds from the auctions. Um, and then this year, uh, the president issued another memorandum on spectrum, uh, really promoting more efficient use of spectrum by federal agencies and focus on spectrum sharing, um, uh, borrowing, uh, borrowing 
somewhat, uh, uh, rather heavily, I would say, from the report last year from the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, put out a report on, on more efficiency in federal spectrum use. Um, the PCAST happens to be in town this week, actually. I was uh, talking to some of the folks over there yesterday to update them on, on what we've been doing. And, and of course, the FCC, um, uh, uh, really busy um, in talking about the PCAST, though I just would mention the 3.5 gigahertz proceeding over there, again, borrowed uh, uh, largely from one of the PCAST's big recommendations. And I, I also want to say, you know, it's been really encouraging to see how the federal agencies, who are huge, uh, in some cases, huge holders of spectrum, uh, how they have been pitching in here um, when uh, the consensus started to build that, that it was time to look uh, very hard at the 1755 band and figure out how DOD and the other agencies can uh, move out of there and uh, make room for uh, wireless broadband. DOD, you know, their, their first reaction working with NTIA was to look at a couple different options, including uh, the uh, 5 gigahertz band, uh, the 2025 band, and the response, not surprisingly, from the incumbents in those bands was some nervousness at having to uh, consider the prospect of sharing with DOD. And what DOD did was really get down to the weeds and figure out what are their real needs. And, and as a result of that work, they actually then said, you know what, we don't need to be in 5 gigahertz. And they are working now with the broadcasters in particular on the 2025 band to figure out a way that that sharing uh, can work. And I think, you know, there's sort of this um, uh, perception or caricature of the relationship between the agencies and the industry as being this, you know, tug of war on spectrum with both sides, uh, you know, not acting reasonably in the agencies, hoarding spectrum and all that. But if you look at the work that these folks are doing, uh, and I'll single out DOD uh, and Terry Takai uh, and her team over there, it's really, really been impressive. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, they need, they've got important missions to, uh, uh, to execute on and to protect, uh, but they are also focused on the economy as well. So, uh, so I congratulate them as well. Um, but it's never easy, and Chairman Wheeler and, and his, uh, his fellow commissioners and his staff are uh, uh, focused on uh, all sorts of things spectrum related, including the auctions uh, mandated by last year's legislation. Um, it's uh, very comforting, comforting to know that he's got uh, folks over there like Gary Epstein and Ruth Milkman on the job, uh, but a lot of a lot of complex moving parts, um, uh, including the focus of, of today's event, the intersection of auction design and competition. Um, you may be aware that the administration has filed some comments uh, in an FCC proceeding uh, touching on this issue, uh, in the proceeding where the FCC is looking at the possibility of reinstituting uh, spectrum caps uh, in the, in the wireless market. Um, I was amused, Michael, that the invitation you sent out uh, included as one of the topics here, does the administration fully support the DOJ's findings? Because I had always thought that DOJ was the administration. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it turns out it is. Uh, I, did, <laughs> I looked it up. Um, you know, Congress now gets creative when they, when they come up with names of bills, you know, so you've got a clever acronym. They didn't used to be, but there was the act to establish the Department of Justice. Uh, and, the, and the words from the statute described as an executive department of the government of the United States. So we can put that one to bed. Um, uh, so just for, you know, I, of course, I just started looking at this. I got to throw in one more point. The Antitrust Division was actually formed in 1933. The DOJ was formed in 18, 1870. Antitrust Division was formed in 1933. The first uh, head of it, the first ass Assistant Attorney General in charge of antitrust was Harold Stevens, who later went on to be the Chief Judge, uh, J Chief Judge of the D.C. Circuit. And remarkable thing there, uh, he was nominated to the D.C. Circuit by President Roosevelt on July 23rd, 1935, and confirmed on July 24th, 1935. <laughs> the good old days. Um, so, yes, we support DOJ's <laughs> findings. They are our findings. Uh, so what did DOJ say? Well, uh, you remember in Animal House, knowledge is good. Well, competition is good. Um, pretty controversial. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we have seen the effects of, of, uh, of good competition. Uh, just some of the numbers I just reeled off uh, are a result of that. But DOJ also pointed out uh, what we learned in Ecom 101, which is that market power can lead to higher prices, and it can insulate a company who has market power from the competitive pressures to expand service uh, or improve quality. Uh, DOJ recognized that 
uh, the four largest carriers uh, compete nationwide on a variety of levels, whether it's uh, coverage or network speed or price. And we want to sustain that uh, with, with carriers, you know, having to reposition and react to each other in a dynamic competitive marketplace. Obviously, Spectrum is a key input uh, in this, in this uh, uh, marketplace. Um, and, uh, and, and DOJ recognized that, uh, you know, auctions are generally the default approach, the best way to maximize the chances of Spectrum being uh, put to the best use for consumers. <clears throat> um, and I think we all know that we, you know, when the issue of Spectrum auctions was, was first developed, the goal was not raising revenue. The goal was efficient allocation of Spectrum. Um, so, uh, so that's still you know, in the statute. It's still the default preferred approach. But in some markets, a rational actor with market power would assign a value to Spectrum that reflects not just the revenue potential, but also the ability to foreclose competition. Um, and, and that means insulating itself from, uh, potentially insulating itself from the competitive pressure uh, that it would otherwise feel. So DOJ asked the commission to keep that rather basic economic theory in mind uh, as they consider auction design. Um, and, you know, this is not to say that the big carriers or anybody are bad guys. Uh, if you talk to the big carriers, they will tell you they welcome competition and it makes them better. Um, but they're not in it to promote their competitors. Their legal obligation is to promote their shareholder value. That's their job. And so that creates incentives <clears throat> that, you know, will be largely good. But DOJ and the antitrust division were created in part to make sure things stay on the right track. Um, DOJ also pointed out that not all spectrum is created equal, and they, you know, chose the one gigahertz dividing line to, to make the point that spectrum below that um, below that line is is uh, better in terms of coverage, better in terms of uh, 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 building, uh, getting inside of buildings, um, and you know that's one of the arguments you hear is well, you know, if if the lower spectrum is better for coverage, that means it's going to cost more. Uh, or, or cost more, uh, the higher uh, range spectrum, less coverage, so it will cost less. You'll have to pay more for the tower, for installing towers and other infrastructure. It all kind of comes out the same. But that doesn't take into account the propagation of spectrum, the lower gigahertz spectrum in uh, uh, inside buildings, uh, another thing that we've, we've pointed out. Uh, there are just a ton of factors here, right? You, you want to take into account uh, equipment, uh, devices, and, and other infrastructure. Um, operating on uh, lots of bands gives your customers more flexibility, but it also makes the devices more expensive because you've got to build that in. Um, but the comments reflect that, you know, we know this is not a one-way street, and they actually pointed out in the comments that there may be substantial efficiencies associated with ownership of relatively large blocks of spectrum. Uh, given the high fixed cost of building out a network, the cost of acquiring new spectrum and deploying it may be relatively low for the, the, the incumbent uh, versus uh, a, a new entrant. So the bottom line is essentially that the FCC needs to balance the economies of scale uh, against the risk of a foreclosure strategy. It's a little more complex than that, but, but that's kind of the way I see it. Uh, easier said than done, of course, but I think that's the way forward if we want to promote competition and, and consumer welfare. There were a few other topics uh, DOJ covered, including uh, the need to maximize predictability up front as much as possible. Uh, folks going into an auction, uh, like any consumer, want to be as educated as possible about the, the scenario they're walking into. Uh, that will itself uh, help drive up uh, revenues. Um, and of course, for each carrier, it's going to be different. They have to consider the, the, the bands being auctioned in, in the context of their own holdings and how complementary they are. Uh, whether in terms of the band or geography. Um, so, uh, you know, I would sum it up as follows. Uh, we think the FCC should consider the potential for anti-competitive foreclosure, uh, particularly in the low-frequency bands. But we recognize the efficiencies of scale, and there has been no call for any particular limit or cap, uh, recognizing there are just a lot of details and a lot of complexity to this. Um, nobody has called for any carriers to be excluded. Uh, and as I said, we've even pointed to the benefits of scale. Um, so then the question is, what about revenues? Um, the auctions that are being designed now are being carried out pursuant to a statute that, among other things, seeks to fund FirstNet. 
uh, and other priorities. Uh, and of course, you know, we'd all like to see further deficit reduction. Um, but it seems to me that even if your sole objective is revenue maximization, economic theory can take you in different directions. I don't, I don't think that's a big headline. I think that is part of economic theory. Um, so, you know, you say, well, let's just eliminate all restrictions and just let it be a free for all and everybody can buy as much as they want and spend as much as they want and that'll maximize revenues. Well, okay, I hear that. But there are other theories, right? There's the theory that says if you've got two big competitors who have 78% or whatever it is of the, of the, of the sub one gigahertz spectrum, that they will have an incentive to essentially overbid, that that will discourage smaller folks from competing, then you actually end up with fewer, not more, uh, competitors, and that could drive revenues down. Um, uh, so, you know, you, our, our urging to the FCC was you, you have to take all of this into account. Um, and of course, everything I just said would be true if revenue maximization was your sole objective, but we know it's not. Congress has instructed the FCC that in designing auction revenue, uh, auction rules, the expectation of revenues can't be the sole or predominant factor. And in the 2012 Act, authorizing and directing the very auctions we're talking about, they recognize the FCC's authority to adopt rules of general applicability, including rules concerning spectrum aggregation that promote competition. Uh, so, you know, there are no guarantees in any of this. There is uncertainty. And I think, you know, essentially what we've urged the FCC to do is what, you know, market actors do in the face of uncertainty, which is you've got to hedge your bets. Uh, you know, you, have, you buy stock because you want it to rise, but you know it might fall. So you buy a put option so you can sell it at a particular price before it sells, falls too far. You're on both sides of it. Uh, uh, that's, that's kind of what we're doing here is we're saying we need to get revenues. We know there's not like a directive. Uh, I don't think there's a legal obligation to raise a certain amount of money, but clearly we want to fund FirstNet. We want to fund deficit reduction. Uh, and, and that's important. Uh, but competition is important too, and, and uh, the folks at DOJ uh, and at the antitrust division, uh, I think have a pretty good track record at, at making these calls and, and, uh, and uh, with the actions we've seen over the last few years in, in promoting a really healthy uh, environment. We've, we've, you know, circling back to the top, we have a great, great ecosystem here. Uh, it's a, a true American success story. It's, it is productivity, it's jobs, uh, and it's the competition that's driving that that, uh, that we want to preserve. Uh, so uh, thank you for, uh, for listening, and uh, uh, I'd be happy to take a few questions if, uh, unless you're yeah, there's, hungry. There's a few, <laughs> yeah, there's a few minutes if you uh, yeah. are willing to take a couple sure. questions. Uh, I don't know if you want to uh, decide who, if uh, the you, you press of any, anything we're gonna, back there. We're going to have an uh, auction to decide who gets to ask questions. So. <laughs> sure. Uh, my question is, who owns the property that the government is going to be um, auctioning through the incentive auction? The broadcasters have been very clear answer. We own 100% of the spectrum, not just the 6 megahertz that each of us have for APSD TV services, but the windfall that is part of the auction for spectrum flexibility for cellular to restaurant. So let's say that it shows up that uh, the total value of your spectrum is result of this incentive auction is 100 billion. I think that's quite low. And that maybe 50 billion of it is the windfall from the spectrum flexibility that goes along with the auction process. Does the public have any residual rights to those properties? Or as the broadcasters say, this is our property. If any money at the end really goes to the public, we're being screwed. Do you accept that view? That's basically the whole subcontext and this event and the way the FCC and Congress has been framing it broadcasters have already won all the rights. It's just a matter of allocating efficiency rather than getting a fair return to the property owner, which might be the public. So basically, do you believe the public actually has any residual rights? You do. That's quite different than what the administration has been saying and acting. So to, to the spectrum that is going to be auctioned through this process. You know, I guess if I were at the FCC and we're in the weeds of trying to figure out how to how to approach this? I, I, I don't think I would jump to uh, trying to resolve questions, of, you know, of of 
high-minded principle. I think I would be focused more on figuring out what are the implications as I, as I move the needle back and forth. So it's okay that they're giving profits, basically. It's their profit, basically. And unless you're strong position, that could be a way to win. Yeah. 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 Um, I would put it the way I just put it. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I did. <laughs> well, there is a Spectrum Act after all, I guess, that needs to be implemented. Yes, uh, Paul? No, no, I'm curious if you could mention the TCAS report. Do you think that's such a bad rap? Because there's lots of, lots of more recently, the particular Spectrum Act that was introduced. I'm curious if you think that it's been either got a bad rap or it's been portrayed. What was the last part, got a bad rap or what? Portrayed. Uh, you know, the, yeah, somewhat. I mean, that, that happens, people need to stake out their positions, but you know, I will point out that uh, you know, it was at and and Google who came together to uh, uh, pitch a proposal in support of the 3.5 gigahertz uh, proceeding, uh, which was largely modeled on the PCAST. So uh, you know, uh, I think views evolved. I think, uh, 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 so I, I'm, I'm uh, I'm very happy to see where we've come uh, uh, since the release of the PCAST report, the 3.5 gigahertz memor uh, NPRM, the presidential memorandum, and I think uh, folks are uh, calming down a little bit in terms of uh, uh, seeing how those recommendations are really playing out. Okay. But it doesn't seem to be burning questions, and we're a few minutes behind, so thanks for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you.